Thank you for coming tonight. I'm Rob Bonta. I'm honored to be the assembly member representing the 18th Assembly District, which includes all of San Leandro as well as um, all of the city of Alameda and almost all of Oakland. And I wanted to come to uh, be here and make myself available to answer questions that you might have about what the state is doing uh, statewide and, and specifically for the district about some of the work that I've been involved in. I wanted to update you on the budget, on, on my uh, specific legislative package, um, the Affordable Care Act, and other issues that you might be interested in, 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 in discussing. So we have, we have, we're here till 8 o'clock, and um, you know, sometimes the, the, the legislature seems far off in a distant place in, in Sacramento, and um, a lot of work happens there, and, and, and folks hear about it through news outlets and, 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 and reports, but it's important for me to bring the work that, that I do on, on your behalf right here to, to um, your hometown. And so we're doing a set of town halls. We did one in Alameda last Friday. We're doing this one today. We have three in Oakland tomorrow. And this is just an opportunity to have some direct engagement on issues that are, that are important to you. So I wanted to start and talk about a few things. I want to start by talking about uh, something that you may have heard of called um, the Barikas. The Barikas decision, which was uh, an, an appellate court decision that um, that addressed the issue of, of how partial taxes can be structured to support schools. And a, a number of well, Bay Area cities have largely been supportive of, of partial taxes. And many of those partial taxes have been structured so that different classifications of property, uh, rational classifications of property, are treated differently, but uniform within that class. So that means that all residential properties are treated the same, but residential properties can be treated differently than vacant properties or than industrial properties or commercial properties. And so um, Alameda had a partial tax that was based on that structure. San Leandro passed one last November, November 12th, I think it was measure L, and they, they both used that, that kind of structure. So the Barigas decision was a, um, it was a multi-level decision. There was a trial court decision which supported that type of, of structure for a parcel tax. There was an appellate court decision that overruled that um, the trial court decision and said that you have to tr treat all types of property exactly the same. That's what, and and, and the, the term that was being interpreted was uniform or uniformity. And then the Supreme Court recently um, declined to accept review of the appellate court decision. So where does that leave us? It leaves us with parcel taxes needing to be uniform in the sense that they need to be treated, every type of property needs to be treated the same. So Measure L does not treat every type of property the same. It teaches, treats residential properties differently than um, units over, uh, than properties with units over a, a different number. And um, I think there was, uh, commercial properties, I think it's two cents per square foot. So, um, and then Alameda actually, uh, that, that has that, my understanding is that the assessments on that tax won't occur until July 1st. Um, and I'm not sure, maybe Mike can tell us about what the school board's doing in terms of it, uh, reacting to the decision. But um, Alameda collected the tax and you know, assessed it, collected it, and spent it. So, so Alameda's in a different, in a, in a different position in the back at, at the trial court level, um, trying to figure out what the next steps are gonna be. But what I did was I introduced a bill on this. The week that I was sworn in, and, and took office, the Barikas appellate decision came down which said that every type of property needs to be treated exactly the same. So I introduced a bill called AB 59, it was my very first bill, and it clarified the meaning of, of uniformity to mean that as long as you treat properties within a rational class the same, then it's uniform. So it, it would allow for the structures that San Leandro used for Measure L, that Alameda used for Measure H, that other um, school districts have used. There were some concerns about that um, from others in the legislature because there was pending legislation, I mean, uh, pending litigation with the Barikas case uh, you know, being active, and that also that there was a, a retroactive component in the bill that would apply um, backward looking to, to Alameda's tax. And so that bill got, it, it's being held right now, well, it's, being a two, it's a two year bill. We're in a two year legislative session. And this is the first year of the two-year session. So bills can move this year and be signed by the governor, or they can move next year. So the AB 59 is being, um, is a two-year bill, and we're going to move forward next year with it. Uh, so starting in January, we're going to ramp up again and try to move the bill forward and, and, and get support and get it through. And what, one of the things that's kind of interesting about it is that
the the section of, of the statute, the section of the, gov of the government code that addresses parcel taxes and uses the word uniform is not the only one that that uses the word uniform and, 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 and applies to parcel taxes. There's other uh, taxing statutes that use the same word that uh, relate to special districts like fire districts and healthcare districts. So we're looking at all of the, um, the, the statutes that use the use word uniform and see if we can have a, a global solution moving forward. So, so just wanted to update you on that because that's been in the news and there may be some concern about that. So there still is an effort to, to have a legislative solution on, on um, uniformity in, in the parcel tax. So I want to start off with that. Number two, I wanted to talk about the budget. So a number of you may have been following the budget. The top line, the, 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 you know, the overview, the summary is that this is one of the best budgets that we've had in many, many years in California. Unfortunately, many of us have gotten used to having budgets that were full of cuts to the things that we care about most, like education and, and health care and, and the social service safety net. And this budget actually has investments, increases in, in um, the amounts of revenue dedicated to all those things. And, and this budget also reflects a number of very important and very exciting and very different approaches to the two areas of the, of the state budget that, that account for the most revenue. And that, that's one, education, and two, healthcare. So what's new in education? From the budget side, um, every single school district in the state of California is gonna get more money in the coming budget year than they did last year. So everybody does better. And that's um, great generally because we need to be spending more money on our, on our children and in our schools, and because we're not nearly at the level where we need to be to have fully funded schools in the state of California, we're still, 49th in the country um, in per pupil school funding, so we're almost dead last. Um, and, and, but, every, but everyone's doing better next year, and, and that's a good thing and for K-12 and, and community colleges. For UCs, there's 125 million more going to UC. For CSU, 125 million more going to, to uh, CSU. So higher ed is getting more money as well too, which is, which is, which is good, which is important, which is the right direction. Does it restore all the past cuts? It does not, but it, it moves us in the right direction and, and it doesn't add to the, the cuts that were there. So we're moving towards restoration. Another important part of the budget this year that, that, that related to education is the middle class scholarship. Some of you may have heard of that. It's um, Speaker John Perez's, uh, it's a very important issue for him and it allows for middle class families who uh, as a family have a household income of less than hundred thousand less than a hundred thousand dollars to get um, forty percent of, of assistance on their tuition and then it, it scales down as you move from a hundred thousand to hundred and fifty thousand so it provides greater access to higher education for middle class families which is an important and an exciting um, tool but the most important thing the fundamental change that that exists this year and this is going to benefit San Leandro greatly actually is what's called the local control funding formula the weighted student formula it's a, a new formula. It was introduced by um, Governor Brown in January and then went through the budget process and through discussions with the legislature was, was tweaked and amended, although it, it generally kept um, it, its core components. And what it does is it provides more funding to schools with students who are in poverty, who uh, are in foster care, or who are English learners. It basically says for students who need the resources most, you will get more resources. And, and that's an important um, uh, uh, change and, and a value that I deeply believe in. And I think if, in San Leandro, there's about 70% of the students fall into one of those three categories. So it's a very high level. I don't know if everybody understands that or appreciates that about the students that are being served in San Leandro. And so this coming year, um, the, per, the, the per pupil, um, San Leandro students will get be getting over $300 more per year under the new formula. So that, that's a very positive change in the right direction. When, when the local control funding formula is fully um, rolled out, I think it's in over eight years, each student will be getting over $1,000 um, more so, so that, than, than under the current formula. So, so that's a good thing. And um, you know, San Leandro is uh, serving more and more students in those three categories, and it's important to have the resources to be able to serve them well. So that's an exciting thing about this year's budget on the education side. What's new on the health care side? Well, the Affordable Care Act. Um, that's, during the campaigns, it was referred to as Obamacare. 
Um, California is one of the first states to, to be rolling out the Affordable Care Act, and we need legislation to do that. We're, um, we have something called Covered California, which is going to create a, a marketplace for, for healthcare plans. It's called um, the Healthcare Exchange, and there will be a certain standard of, of care that's provided by these different plans, and you can shop for the one that meets your needs um, and, 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 um, and your, your cost level. And then we're also doing the Medi-Cal expansion this year, where uh, there's about six million um, uh, California residents who are not covered by health care, and, and the Medi-Cal expansion will, will cover 1.4 million of them. So it makes a big dent, covers more folks, makes sure that people who need health care have health care. And so that's different, and that's exciting. And so for me, as a first-year legislator, just getting there and being able to be part of a decision, um, with the local control funding formula that, that fundamentally changes the way public school finance happens in the state of California. And in the same year to be part of the healthcare, um, the Affordable Health Care Act, the ACA, um, was, was very exciting. And I think those are two areas of, of real progress where we're covering more people and providing health care to people who need it and providing more resources in the public schools to the students who need them more. Um, the social service safety net also is getting more funding. You've heard in the past about cuts to things, important programs for people who need them like CalWORKS, uh, which is our, 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 our state welfare program, CalFresh, which is the food stamp program, in-home support services, subsidized child care. All those have been cut drastically in the past. All of those get more money this year. So um, I think it's 30 or $70 million for, for subsidized child care. They're, they're, um, and and there's, there's various amounts for each of those categories. They don't fully restore all the past cuts, but they move in the right direction and they start restoring those past cuts. Many, some of you have heard that in Medi-Cal, um, adult dental had been lost. Adult dental is restored in a, um, in, a, in a slightly different form this year. So we're starting to come back and, and the state is starting to, to, to fund and provide those services that it had to cut in, in the past. And there's also a very important priority of the governor, important priority for the legislature is to make sure that we do all this in a fiscally responsible way. So uh, the stage is set to have a, a quote unquote rainy day fund so that when the economy um, and the state budget, which, which are, are, are volatile and swing, um, the, the, the budget is tied to the economy. When the economy swings, so does, so does the budget. So that there's money in those, in those downturn times when, when there's a recession, like the Great Recession that we had to help smooth out um, the revenues for the, for the state of California, make sure that we can continue to provide services when people need it. Because the irony of uh, recessions in California is that when people are hurting and are losing their job and need services the most, that's when the services get cut. So having the rainy day fund will help prevent that, which is, which is a, a good thing and, and just just practical, good sense government. Um, we also spend a lot of time, or, or a significant amount of resources in this budget and in past budgets paying down uh, debt. So lowering our debt level, um, and that's important to the overall fiscal health of the state as well. So, so a lot of good moves in the right direction, some exciting things happening on, on the budget side. We, we hope and expect that the economy will continue to improve, that next year's budget will, will be one that also has good news for uh, Californians. And um, uh, you know, th this budget this year actually had, had a surplus that was unexpected. Uh, so we started off with a, a balanced budget proposed in, in January, and then as, as uh, the months passed between January and today, uh, more money came in than was anticipated and projected, so we ended up with a surplus. A lot of that went to the Prop 98 formula, which means that the money was spent on schools, but there was also some additional money to, to use to do things like provide $63 million to our courts, which have been suffering mightily uh, during this period of time and, be, and been cutting, been getting cut. So people who need TROs because of domestic violence and um, you know, small businesses that need to do transactions to keep their business alive are able to get access to, to the courts again and have access to justice. So, so ju just a, a lot of things in this year's budget that were exciting. Did we solve every problem? We did not. But did we make progress in a lot of important areas? We did. And, and that's what you need to do every year. We need to make progress uh, one year and then build, make more progress the next year and continue to do that to earn the trust of the Californians and provide them the services that they need. So that's a little bit about uh, the budget. Uh, the Affordable Care Act. I want to also talk about my specific legislative package. I think some of you have saw um, a number of the candidate forums and, and events where I spoke as a, as, a, as, a, as a candidate and I talked about four things that I still talk about, which are uh, were my priorities then and my priorities now. Strengthening our public schools, 
making sure we have safe streets, creating more good jobs, and protecting and securing the social service safety net. So I have bills in each of those areas for strengthening our public schools. I talked about AB 59, which was the, the, the parcel tax bill that would help um, localities have local control over whether or not they want to invest more in education. Um, on public safety, you know, we're in the middle of a really important and interesting debate about gun violence. And nationally, you know, the, the Congress is, and the President are, are trying to act and acting. Um, the state is also acting. We're lucky that, that in California, we've been one of the leaders in addressing the gun violence issues. And uh, it, Oakland, which is in the district, as I mentioned, has, one, has the highest level of gun violence in the state of California. And it's one of the highest uh, in, the, in the country. It's one of the top five. So trying to figure out how to get our arms around that, that, that problem, um, honor the constitutional rights that are given in the Constitution to, to, to gun owners, and also try to save people's lives and, and decrease injuries and crimes related to guns is, is an important priority for me. And so I had a number of bills that I introduced that uh, on, on gun legislation. One of them that's moving right now is, is specific to Oakland. Some of you might know that the state of California is solely and exclusively given the authority to pass laws relating to gun licensing and, and, um, and gun owner licensing and gun registration. The bill that I have, it's called AB 180, would create a carve out for the city of Oakland so that they would not be preempted by the state of California and they could act on their own to create uh, registration and licensing laws uh, for Oakland. Uh, the argument being that Oakland has a unique set of circumstances with, with, a, with a very high gun violence rate and that they should have, be able to exercise local control to, to, to address and, and solve that problem. So that bill's gotten a lot of support in both the assembly and in, um, it's on the Senate side now, so that, that, that bill is moving um, as, we, as we speak. Job creation and economic revitalization, two things I want to mention on that. I, I lamented, as many of you in this room, I know there's some of our city officials who are here and our elected city leaders who are here, lamented the, the loss of redevelopment agencies. But there was a lot of projects in the city of Alameda that relied on redevelopment funding, uh, also in, in, in San Leandro and also in Oakland. And um, they were above, they were, RDAs were abolished and there's been no replacement provided um, since then. So, so it's much harder now to do the two things that RDAs allowed us to do, which is uh, build affordable housing and create projects that economically revitalize blighted areas. And some of the projects uh, you know, that, are, that are currently under um, construction and are going right now, have there have been in disputes with the Department of Finance and I've been um, advocating for San Leandro and Oakland and Alameda um, with the Department of Finance to help let those projects go forward. Um, but what I've done is I, I've co-authored two bills, one with the Speaker of the Assembly, John Perez, and um, I think one of them is AB 229 and the other one's AB 243, and, and the other bill is with an assembly member named Roger Dickinson. They both do a similar thing. Um, they create what are called I, um, IFRD, IRFDs, Infrastructure Revitalization Financing Districts. Um, the one, the bill with the speaker, John Perez, is limited to former military properties like Alameda Point and um, Oakland Army Base and Oakland Naval Hospital. Uh, in this district, but for all military properties across the state. The, the one with Mr. Dickinson is for any formally designated redevelopment agency area. And so the IRFDs could be created by either a vote of the people or in some circumstances a vote of the elected leaders, the city council, and a bond could be floated to provide a capital infusion for a project for um, economic revitalization or, or affordable housing. And then it, the, the, it would be paid back with some of the tax increment that is generated from the project that's created. Similar model to, to redevelopment agencies. And what's interesting is sort of the governor, the, what the governor is going to do about this. Many of you know the governor was the mayor of Oakland. Oakland used a lot of, had a lot of redevelopment um, agency projects. And, but now the governor is, has basically said that um, until redevelopment agencies are wound down, until those projects end and um, there's, there's, a, there's closure um, he won't be that interested in, in a replacement. So last year, the, the IRFD bill that the speaker had went to his desk and he vetoed it. 
there's been more progress in winding down redevelopment agencies this year. The economy is in a better state this year than it was last year. The budget's in a better state last year than it was this year. So there's, there's a possibility that one or both of these bills could get signed this year. But he's been, just to be totally honest with everybody, so you know, to, to sort of um, make sure I'm conditioning expectations appropriately, you know, he hasn't been inclined to, to support a, a replacement. But you know, it's a new year, and there's, there's new hopes for, for, the, for the two bills. Um, and then the social service safety net, those are mostly issues that are addressed with the budget. And I talked about how many of the, the services that are important to, to many of us are getting more funding this year. So, so I've uh, done my best to work on the areas that I talked about during the, the campaign, and, and I think we've made progress in, in each of those areas, and, and hoping that we'll, we'll continue to do so. Just a couple other random bills that maybe don't fit so cleanly into one of those categories, but that I'm working on. I have one bill that it's called AB 817 that would allow um, lawful permanent residents to serve as poll workers on election day. Why is that important? There are a large number of, of, of citizens across the state who are not deemed quote unquote English proficient or, or who, who prefer to speak in their native language. And so they're not able to fully exercise their fundamental right to vote when they go to the polls without language uh, access, assistance, and services. And the federal government has recognized that, and through the Voting Rights Act, has required language access assistance to be, to be provided in poll, uh, polls throughout the state. But it's hard to get uh, folks to volunteer to provide those, that assistance. And they're always very difficult to recruit, and sometimes they're not recruited adequately. So by allowing lawful permanent residents to serve as poll workers, you increase the pool of multilingual poll workers who can then um, serve as poll workers and help provide voters with their, um, the, the services they need to have the fundamental right to vote. So that, that bill has gotten um, a lot of momentum behind it, and, and it's, a, it's gone from the Assembly side to the Senate side. It's on the, the Senate floor now. Um, another one, which is kind of interesting, I think, uh, and I think very important, but not uncontroversial, is a bill that, would, that I'm, I have called AB 999, which would require access to condoms in prison. So why is that important? Um, in our prisons, the uh, uh, rate of HIV AIDS is eight times higher than it is outside of prison. And statistics show that up to 40% of, of inmates are, are having um, sexual contact. And they're doing it without, without condoms. So HIV and AIDS is being spread within the prison. And when prisoners uh, get out and, 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 and re-enter their community, um, they're spreading it to their family, their partners, um, and so that's a problem. And and and, and it's a, there's a simple public health solution to it. It's inexpensive. It makes sense. We use it in other areas, but we've we've not done it in in the prison setting. And so this bill will literally save lives and have a high public health impact. And it also will have a, a positive fiscal impact on the state of California because I think it's like a dollar thirty two cents for a condom. Um, it costs uh, up to hundreds of thousands of dollars to, for example, treat somebody with HIV AIDS on Medi-Cal. So it, it's, it's the basic rule that we all know about of, um, I'm gonna say it wrong, but uh, an ounce of prevention saves a pound of cure or something like that, you know, just, just acting preventively in, in, in a simple and practical way. So that's a little bit about our, our bill package. Um, I also wanted to say a few general things about the, the, the legislature and being in Sacramento, sort of being someone who's from local government. I, for those who don't know, I was the vice mayor of the city of Alameda. I was a director of the Alameda Healthcare District, and I was a deputy city attorney in the San Francisco City Attorney's Office for almost 10 years. And heard a lot about the dysfunctionality of, of, of Sacramento. I, I read a lot and, and lived through all those difficult cuts to our schools and, and to uh, our, our social services and, and healthcare programs and redevelopment agencies. And I was expected, I mean, I was prepared for all that. Um, but I was pleasantly surprised, and I, and I continue to be. One, just sort of getting a proposed balanced budget from the governor and then having surplus come in after that. You know, that's, that's unheard of in recent memory in California. And then two, getting the budget passed from the we had a constitutional deadline of June 15th to pass the budget, uh, and 
we were done by 1 p.m. on June 15th. We were there on a Saturday on June 15th, but we had no overnight sessions. We had no, um, you know, late nights there where we're just, you know, hanging around trying to get the budget. We didn't go past the deadline, which was good because under Prop 14, my and all my legislative colleagues' compensation would have been cut. Um, and so, you know, and so, you know, we're we're working not dysfunctionally. So, so, and and, it, and many times we're we're, we're working um, in a way that I think is is um, meets the meets the expectations that we have of of the voters of, of California. So, so I was expected to see expecting to see some things that um, would be disappointing, and it's not it's far from perfect, but but I think we're we're meeting the, hitting the marks in many ways, and and, and that's important. Uh, a couple other things just to note: there's a there's two thirds majority of Democrats. Um, or there was until yesterday in, um, in both houses. And the only reason there's not is because for a couple of seats, members were elected to other offices and until the special election is called and a new member is elected and takes that seat, a Democrat won't, won't come back in. They're safe Democratic seats, so there's gonna be two thirds when all the music stops and everyone takes their chair and sits down and, and, and the legislature is fully constituted again. Um, but but that, that's allowed some, some, the possibility of some, some important things, some exciting things. Why is a two-thirds majority important? One, a two-thirds majority legislature can override a, a gubernatorial veto if necessary. Is that likely? Not, not totally likely because we have a democratic legislature and a democratic governor. And if we're working together and talking, that's not necessary, but should it become necessary, it's possible. And two, with two thirds majority legislatures, you can um, pass revenue enhance enhancements if you need to, t taxes. Um, or you can vote constitutional amendments to be put on the ballot for the people to consider and vote on in an upcoming election. And some of you also may remember when it took two thirds a, a majority of the legislature to pass the budget. That's no longer true. It only takes fifty percent. So that it was it was a little bit easier to pass the budget this year. But we had two thirds anyway, and, and as Democrats. So um, at the beginning of this year, when the two thirds uh, was was known, and it was a little bit of a surprise. I think you know, this last election cycle, there's been a lot of analysis done on it, but with sort of the Obama wave. Um, going across California, there was a lot of support from Democrats for Proposition 30, a lot of support from Democrats against Proposition 32, brought, so it brought out a lot of Democrats to the polls in a presidential election, and there were certain seats that were known to be um, likely Republican and not expected to be pickups for Democrats, where we did pick up. So that's how we did get the two-thirds. And right after the two-thirds, there was a number of different ideas that have been proposed, that were proposed in the legislature. Um, one that I um, I'm supportive of it and, and hope will come back, was lowering the Prop 13 required thresholds for local taxes. So the parcel taxes that we talked about earlier today, my bill doesn't address the threshold, but to pass a parcel tax in a local jurisdiction, and you, you need to have a two thirds super majority. The, the, the ideas that were introduced were to lower that to a lower super majority of 55%. So still a super majority, not just a simple majority of 50% plus one, but a, but a lower, um, a lower supermajority. And, and that was being proposed for all sorts of different um, taxes, from parcel taxes to public safety taxes to, um, to, to other areas. Transportation, Measure B1, remember, lost by 700 votes. That means that, that as a result, $7 billion on transportation was lost. And, and that, would have, that could be moved to, to 50% or to 55% uh, instead of two thirds. So that's one. Um, all of those threshold lowering measures are being held, were held as a leadership decision in the committee that they were in. So they're gonna, they're gonna wait to address those till next year. Again, remember we're in, we're in year one of a two year legislative session, so those bills can still move next year. The other one, uh, the other category of bills that are, are, are stalled or, or dead are any new taxes proposed by legislators. So uh, there was a senator, Senator Monning, who introduced a soda tax, a, a sweetened beverage tax, and that bill, um, I think it died, it died in appropriations. And I had a tax, uh, a tax on ammunition, a uh, bullet tax, that also uh, died in appropriations. So no, no new taxes moved this year. They didn't go to the assembly floor or the Senate floor. 
um, they were killed. And part of that is because uh, our governor has said that the new tax is Prop 30. Uh, we all voted that in. And, and he's made a commitment to not have any new taxes unless the voters approve them. So the uh, taxes being approved by the, uh, being generated by the legislature, he's not as interested in. Um, another one is that the another reason why those died, both the threshold lowering measures and the taxes, is because um, I think there was a leadership decision to show that the two thirds majority was going to be patient and deliberate and thoughtful and not do 10 million taxes and five million constitutional changes in year one. So. That's, I, I know some of you have been following those issues, so I want to update you on where those were and, and what the thinking was behind it. Um, and, and so it, it, it's been exciting to have a supermajority and to have a, uh, a Democratic governor. You know, There's a lot of things that could have made this year look different than, than it does now. Um, I'm a Democrat, many of you know that, and you know we could have had another, another president, uh, not Mr. Obama, not, not a Democratic president, uh, we could have had Prop 30 not passing and, and been in a very different position in how we invested in our schools. We could have had um, no, not gotten past the quote unquote fiscal cliff. Prop 39 may not have passed, which provides more uh, money for our schools as well for um, in, in, you know, environmentally sustainable projects. So there's a lot of things that happened that collectively allowed us to be in the position that we're in. And, and the governor and, and my legislative colleagues who were not elected this year, who had been there before I got there, had to make tough, very tough decisions over the past few years that they, that, that they didn't like to make, but, but uh, had to make, including you know, you know, the speaker, John Perez, he, he was elected two cycles before me, so he's been there for four years. He's in his fifth year now. And when they got in, uh, when they got elected and sworn in, within a, a few days, they were on the assembly floor making decisions about how to make $40 billion worth of cuts. The entire California budget is only about $100 billion. So they're cutting 40% of all the services California provides to Californians um, after just getting elected. So um, they say that we're um, ungrateful and lucky because we came in and we got to increase uh, uh, services and investments in some of those areas that we care about uh, the most. So um, I don't want to spend all the time talking. I want to answer some questions as well. And just want to make sure I cover the main areas. Oh, the final area, and I'll just touch on it real briefly because we've talked about the theme already, is um, I'm on five committees. I'm the chair of, of a standing committee, and I'm also the chair of a select committee. So the committees I'm on, I'm the chair of what's called the PERS committee. And it's not CalPERS, although it does have jurisdiction over CalPERS. It's the Public Employees Retirement Social Security Committee. Basically, it, it, it has jurisdiction over anything related to public employees. And then I'm on transportation, I'm on health, I'm on banking and finance, and I'm on elections and redistricting. Health in particular has been very exciting because all of the bills, we're in a, a special session to implement the Affordable Care Act and all the bills that are part of that special session that implement the Affordable Care Act have come through the Health Committee. So that's been really interesting and very exciting. And then I, I was named to be the chair of a select committee, and that select committee is the um, Select Committee on Gun Violence in the East Bay. And so we've had hearings on, on gun violence. We had one in Oakland. A number of weeks ago, we're gonna have another one in Stockton, which is a city that's also faced uh, very high levels of gun violence, and we're gonna have another one in Oakland after that. And we're bringing in stakeholders and community leaders and elected leaders to talk about the problem and, 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 and the best solutions and the best practices to inform potential future legislation, but also efforts at the city level and at the federal level um, and in the community to, to address gun violence, because it's gonna take a, a multitude of approaches to, to really make a, make a dent in the problem and, and reduce gun violence. So, those are my opening remarks. I, I, uh, I, want, I know it covers a lot of ground, but I, I did want to come and, and uh, report back to you as constituents on the work that I've been doing on your behalf in, in Sacramento. And, you know, one really unfortunate thing about, about this job is um, I was elected November 6th and I got sworn in on December 3rd. We started the legislative session on January 7th. So at the very time where I wanted to be here in the district, in the community, um, you know, strengthening relationships and getting ideas from constituents about potential legislation, we were in Sacramento, um, you know, four days a week. So that made it tough. And we're, we're after next week, we're on the verge of a, about a month-long break 
from the legislative session, session and then we return uh, for the entire month of August and the first two weeks of September. And that's when all the bills either die or get through the second house um, and get onto the governor's desk and the governor um, starts signing those bills. And then the rest of the year, we're, we're back in the district. So I look forward to being in the district more. Um, and, 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 but my, my, my top-notch district team is, is here in the district every day uh, working on your behalf. And I want to say a little bit about that and, and also introduce the, um, my, my staff who are here. Jim Odie is here. He's my district director. Many of you know Jim. <laughs> and we also have uh, Jacqueline Orpelia, who is our senior field rep. Um, and so we get a lot of constituent services requests. Uh, we've gotten a lot of requests for assistance with foreclosures. And so, and, and we're able to help, and I want to encourage any of you who know folks who need assistance in, in that area to, to contact our office because we have established relationships with the banks where we can call on behalf of a constituent and help work out a modification or a delay in a foreclosure. We've, able, we've been able to keep people in their homes, which is very important to us and, and, and very important to them and, and a part of the work that we do. So please let us know if there's anyone that, that you know that needs that kind of help. And for any state service that anyone is receiving, whether it be with DMV or the Franchise Tax Board or um, unemployment benefits, we can help um, move that along. Sometimes government doesn't move as fast as we'd like and we can help facilitate and make sure that the services that, that you're entitled to, you receive, and, and that that process is, is something that's more enjoyable for you um, and works for you. So I just wanted to mention that. And um, okay, I, I want to open it up to questions and, and have a conversation. We don't have a, a, a huge group here. I guess we have written questions that are being... mention one other thing um, that relates specifically to San Leandro, and, and, and that's this. There was a, my apologies, I, I think it's uh, oh, San Leandro Crossings, the, the TOD project near the BART station. So we worked with some of the, the, the lobbyists for, for San Leandro and, and the partners in that project to help get an extension on some of the, the TOD funding that was, uh, was going to expire and run out for that project. So we, we, through that work, we were able to put in a, in a budget, it's a bud, called a budget trailer bill. Um, there's these, after you pass the official budget, there's all these other bills that have cleanup language and then sometimes language that's not necessarily related to the budget uh, specifically um, that, that are part of the, the final budget process. And, and so through that extension, we were able to assist that project and, and, and make sure that some of the government funding that it was going to expire, continue to be available for that project. So that's a San Leandro specific item that I wanted to mention. You want to do hands or? We can do those, we want to do those first. And it's better if we have a car because then we can log it and okay. take your, your question and make sure you get an answer if we're not able to answer it today. Okay, so uh, I'll just kind of take it one at a time. Can you share a little bit about the origin and purpose of AB 174 current status as well? Uh, thank you. So, AB 174, uh, I'm sorry I didn't mention it, it's, it's a bill that I, I'm authoring. What it does is it creates uh, school-based health centers that provide services related to trauma. So, we have school-based health centers now. Um, they're, they're areas in schools where um, you can get different types of health services. A lot of them are, are, are sort of basic health screenings and, and sometimes dental services, but, but what's been missing um, particularly in, in areas like Oakland that needs it are services related to trauma. So if you experience or witness trauma, gun violence for example, um, and you're suffering from depression or post-traumatic stress disorder, that those types of services are, are not being provided. So this, this bill in its original form would provide those services through the school-based health center uh, vehicle statewide and then it got cut down in appropriations unfortunately so now it's, a, it's an Alameda County pilot where there will be 10 locations providing those services. And then the idea of a pilot is you work out the bugs, you make it work, um, you, you perfect the model, and then you can go to scale and spread it more widely. So we'll still have it here in Alameda County, specifically in Oakland, 
Um, if there are San Leandro locations that, that, that make sense for it, we'll identify those as well. Um, but that's, that's AB 174. So I wanted to mention just on that issue, I was at a, at a great organization um, called uh, EOYDC, East Oakland Youth Development Center. And they're based in East Oakland, and we met with some of the young people there today. And because they do a summer program and after school program as well. And I was talking to them about issues that were important to them. And uh, the, the director of the program was there with me, and she asked the young people to raise their hand if they've been affected by gun violence and almost two-thirds of them raised their hand. So this isn't uh, an issue that is fabricated or made up or created in a vacuum. It's, it's based on um, you know, real impacts on, on, on children's lives. So um, I'm excited about this bill, and it, it, it's got some momentum, and it's moving forward. OK, uh, how does the new state budget affect San Leandro schools? Will San Leandro schools get more funding than uh, I'm going to go with presently, <laughs> and I can't make out the, the, the oh, categoricals. So I think I talked about that a little bit. Uh, the local control, control funding formula is very beneficial to San Leandro, over $300 more per, per student next year, uh, in excess of $1,000 per, per kid in, in, when the local control funding formula rollout is completed and it's fully grown. Um, there are a, a few categoricals that remain, and um, uh, one of them is adult education, another one of them is, is, is uh, transportation, and there's a third one, um, uh, regional occupant, occupation programs, I think. So there's a couple categoricals remain, but the idea of the local control funding formula is, 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 is to push the money and the resources down to the locals and allow them uh, within, a, you know, with, within a bounded range to spend that money in the ways they think is most effective. You can't spend it on anything you want. You can't take all the money that's supposed to be for kids in poverty and, and foster children and English learners and spend it on non-English learners and non-foster kids and the wealthiest students. Because there's, there's something also called the Local Control Accountability Program, which requires accountability and reports and a plan to be made for how you're gonna spend the money and then a report out later to show that you spent money in, in conformity with the plan. So I, I, I have heard some um, concerns about accountability, and, and there is accountability built in, but there also is a, a value built into the local control funding formula of allowing locals who are closest to the students and the needs of the school to be able to exercise their discretion and best how to best use the money uh, within the broader mission of, of what the program is, is doing. 